Okay, so welcome to the fifth lecture devoted to the concentration of measure. So today we shall continue the development of the entropy method that we have started uh, last time. And more precisely, uh, we shall now uh, prove the uh, Talagrand inequality for empirical process, processes, which is a very difficult uh, and deep result, which has been proved by Talagrand in 1996. And we have now all what we need to prove it by combining the Frankenstein exponential inequality that we have uh, established last time and the, Poisson, the sub Poissonian bound that we have proved for non-negative empirical processes. So let's see uh, how it works. So we consider uh, independent random vectors. And we suppose that the uh, components are all centered at expectation of this vector. And we look at the quantity Z, which is the soup of the sum of the XIT. And we are interested in uh, the concentration of this quantity around its expectation. So right now we shall prove an exponential inequality, a sub Gaussian inequality. But uh, before doing this, it's interesting to see what uh, does a Frenchstein gives you to bound the variance of Z? Because it will give us some informations about the sensitive quantities to look at. So if we do that, let's first have a look at this. Uh, if we do that, we see that the variance of Z is less than two times the expectation of W. And what is this W? The W is the soup of the sum of the xit square. So let's see why this w appears. So we look at uh, the symmetrized uh, variables, z prime i. In this case, the variables z prime i are easily uh, accessible. We look at the soup of the sum of the xjt, and we just add uh, x prime it, and remember that x prime is a copy of x, which is independent of x. So now we use the same trick as we have used several times right now. That is, we express that the soup of the sum of the xjt is achieved somewhere at some t star here. So we write Z as the sum of the XJT star. And we just use the fact that Z prime I, which is a soup, is always larger than uh, the quantity which is under the soup here at any point. So it is larger in particular than the quantity at point T star, which appears here. And now if you use that, it appears that the difference between Z and, my, and Z prime I is less than X I T star minus X prime I T star, because the only difference between the two summons here is that the i coordinate differs. In one case, you have x i t. In the other case, you have x prime i t. So you just have the difference between the two, which appears with the positive part. So now uh, we just have to compute the expectation of this quantity square condition, conditioned by x. So this is what we do now. We compute the difference between Z and Z prime I positive part square conditioned by X. 
and this is less than uh, the expectation of the uh, variable z prime z prime i t star square, and the expectation is performed with respect to the variable x prime. So you recover merely the expectation square of the variable and computed at t star plus the variable x i t star square, which is me measurable with respect to x. And so at the end of the day, the v plus quantity, which is merely the sum of the expectation of the z minus z prime i positive part square knowing x are less than the soup of the sum of the x i t square, which is an upper bound for this guy here, and uh, plus the soup, oh, excuse me, this is not that like that, excuse me. The, the, this, this uh, guy here will be taken into account here, excuse me. And this uh, quantity is merely the soup of the sum of the VIT. And so now Efranstein's inequality tells you that the variance of Z is less than the soup of the sum of the expectation of the XIT square plus the quantity where the soup and the expectation are in the reverse uh, are exchange. And the you get the expectation over the soup of the sum of the XIT square. That is exactly the expectation of W. And of course, you can bound the total of these quantities here by two times the expectation of W, just because you know that the expectation of the soup is always greater than the soup of the expectation. And so at the end of the day, you get this upper bound on the variance. So in the Radnocker, in the Radnocker case that we have analyzed already, things were nice because uh, this uh, sum of XIT square are constants. They are just the sum of the alpha i t square. So the W is deterministic, and it's much easier to handle than the general case. In the general case, the difficulty is that your W is random, and you have to do something on this W. And this is exactly uh, what we have to do to uh, prove Talagrand's inequality now. And we turn to this proof. First we state it, and then we, we make the proof. So the statement of Talagrand's inequality goes like that. You look at uh, the soup of the empirical process. You assume the variables to uh, lie between minus one and plus one. And you consider this W quantity that we have seen playing a role in the Efronstein's inequality. And then uh, the statement is that there are some absolute constants such that the probability that Z minus expectation of Z is larger than a sub Gaussian term here plus a linear term is less than exponential minus X. So imagine that C2 is equal to zero, you would get a full sub Gaussian inequality in the full range on the full half line. The fact that you make this linear term appear makes exactly as in Bernstein's inequality, that is that you have a sub Gaussian tail in a bandwidth. And then after that, you have another behavior. So you have to see this inequality as a super Bernstein's inequality because you have the soup of the sum and not only a single sum. 
And the price to pay is to make this strange W process, process appear here. And the variance factor that you get is not exactly what you could expect. That is, you could expect that uh, the, 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 the variance factor would be the maximal variance of the empirical process. This is not as nice as this. You have this expectation of W which appeared instead and which is a bit embarrassing, but that's, uh, that's life. So just some remarks. Uh, first, excuse me, come back to the slide. Uh, the proof that we shall make here, we shall give uh, very precise constants, okay? Because here in the Telegram original proof, uh, the constants were just, there exists some absolute constants. But in the proof that we shall provide, the constants will be explicit. So talking about explicit constants, um, the target is what you get in dimension one. In dimension one, when T is just a single point, we know that the optimal constants come from Bernstein's inequality and they are C1 equal to one and C2 equal to one third. And the proof that we shall provide will lead to constants which are C1 equal C to C2 equal to two. So you see that we miss the target, but not the, the, const, the values are not ridiculous. And the third remark is that we shall uh, see later on in the second half of my course that it is possible to compare the expectation of W with the maximal variance, which is what we would like to get in some sense, and to produce uh, a really ready to use inequality. But this is another story and this is done with tools which have nothing to do with uh, concentration. So now we turn to the proof of Talagans inequality. And the good surprise is that uh, the hard work has been done. That is, uh, now we just have to uh, bend over and get the fruits uh, that have grown. That is, we have in the one hand, this nice structural Efronstein's inequality. So we start from the exponential Efronstein's inequality. Which tells us that the log of the moment generating function is less than lambda over one minus lambda times the log of the moment generating function of V plus. And provided that lambda is between zero and one, of course. And here note that we choose theta equal to one just because the variables are less than one. If the variables were uniform, uniformly bounded by some B here, we, uh, we would adapt the theta to the B, okay? So now we have seen already that uh, the V plus for the soup of the empirical process is merely less than V plus W where uh, W is the sum of the X I T square And V is the soup 
of the sum of the expectation of the XIT square. So this guy is nice. This is what we would expect in some sense. And uh, this W is not so nice because it is random. So it is the very place where we need an idea. And it is the very place where when you look at carefully the, 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 the proof, the original proof of Telegram's inequality, things become rather uh, obscure. That is, there are some uh, calculations here in the original Telegram's proof, which uh, are based on the Q point inequalities and that the, some tools that Telegram has developed before the 1996 year. And now, for us, the idea will be very simple just because remember that this W, excuse me, this is not, I've made a mistake here, I've forgotten a soup, of course. And this W is uh, self bounding. And this saves us. Because since W is self bounding, we just have to use our sub Poissonian bound. which tells us that the log of the moment generating function of W is less than the expectation of W times the exponential of lambda minus one. So of course, coming back to V plus, The, the log of the moment generating function of V plus will be less than V times lambda plus the psi W here. And so this is less than V lambda plus the expectation of W multiplied by exponential lambda minus one that you can brutally bound by two times the expectation of W multiplied by exponential lambda minus one, because you know that the second term here is always larger than the first term, okay? And now it's almost done because we just have uh, to combine this with uh, the exponential f bound. To get that the log of the moment generated function of the quantity of interest, that is Z minus expectation, is less than lambda over lambda over one minus lambda. Times two expectation of W times expectation uh, exponential lambda minus one. So now we want to get uh, a Bernstein type upper bound. So uh, we look at some upper bound with the following shape. 
lambda w square, lambda square w, excuse me, over 2, 1 minus c lambda. This is the shape that we are looking for. So to get this shape, it's very easy. We just have to notice that the exponential of lambda minus one, when lambda is small, this is lambda. But if, if you want to upper bound it in a non-asymptotic way, you upper bound it by lambda over one minus lambda. Just because you look at lambda, which is less than one. And so this upper bound here becomes this is less than lambda squared, that's okay, over one minus lambda squared. Mm -hmm. We shall see what to do with that. Times two expectation of W, it's okay, it's a constant. So the last step is just to notice that one minus lambda square is always larger than one minus two lambda. And so what you get is that uh, the upper bound writes like this, it's lambda square two expectation of W over one minus two lambda. And this is for lambda less than one half. So you have uh, the, the right shape. This is equal to lambda square small w over two one minus c lambda. If you take the right values for the constant, that is c equal to two and small w equals to four times the expectation of capital W. And so we have seen that uh, in the situation where you have this shape as an upper bound for the log of the moment generating function, Chernoff's inequality tells you that the probability that z minus expectation of z is larger than the square root of two small w x plus c x is less than exponential of minus exponential minus x. And you get the result just by plugging w equal to four expectation of capital w and small c equal to two. And so we get the result that we have announced. This is the end of the proof. So as you see, uh, the proof is uh, very, very simple. And uh, it's very pleasant for me to present in a, in a master course, uh, the proof of this result, which is uh, considered as one of the most difficult results of the theory. So now uh, I change a little bit the, the topic in the sense that uh, for the moment we have seen uh, inequalities on the variance and we have seen exponential inequalities. But of course, there is some life between the square and the exponential. And one can wonder if it's possible to interpolate between the two and get moment inequalities uh, for, for situations where the variables 
that we are looking at are not necessarily uh, bounded, but uh, they can be Q integrable with a Q which can be large, but not uh, equal to infinity. So this is the purpose of this uh, chapter now to investigate phi entropy and moment inequalities because naturally, if we face uh, the issue of building moment inequalities, we shall use uh, entropies which are no longer classical entropy with the x log x function, but uh, much more entropies which are defined with power functions. So we have to look at carefully uh, what can we get with uh, phi entropies. And the, the, the key is the convexity. We have seen that uh, for the classical entropy, uh, the subadditive inequality for entropy has been derived from the duality formula. So on a formula which says that the entropy is convex. So the first point and the first thing that we have to understand is what, for what kind of functions phi, the phi entropy happens to be convex. And first of all, uh, we have to realize that convexity can be used to prove uh, the sub additive inequality for entropy for the, in the classical case. But we have to realize right now that the converse is true. That is, a subadditive inequality exists only if we have convexity. And this is the first thing that I would like to, to see with you. So let's recall the definition of phi entropy. So it's merely the computation of the expectation of phi of y minus phi of the expectation of y for a random variable, which takes its values in the given interval and which is integrable. And we have already seen that the case where phi is a square corresponds to the variance, while the case where the function phi is x log x corresponds to the classical entropy. So now I would like to uh, see with you that the convexity of the phi entropy is necessary to get a subadditive inequality. So what, uh, what is called a subadditive inequality here is uh, merely uh, what you have in mind. That is, we shall say that the subadditive inequality holds if for any set of independent variables, any integrable function of those variables, we have the entropy, the phi entropy, which is less than the sum of the expectation of the conditional entropies with the usual notation. That is, bracket i means that you are looking at expectation knowing x bracket i, where x bracket i is the original vector where you have removed the i coordinate. And in some sense, uh, the fact that uh, the subadditive inequality implies convexity, uh, it's already true for dimension two. In some sense, it's dimension two, which is critical because as soon as you have the, the, the result for the dimension two, you have the full result in some sense by an induction argument. So the, the, the dimension two is critical. So let's look uh, carefully what does the subadditive inequality mean? So if you consider the dimension two, if we denote by mu i here, the distribution of the variable xi, the subadditive inequality means that the phi entropy, which makes a first time this term appear, is less than the expectation of 
the sum of the two different conditional phi entropies. And each time that you take the expectation of the conditional entropy, you make the same term as here appear. You make it appear the first time and the second time. So I can remove and I can subtract these two terms here, they cancel. And I may rearrange the inequality, which appears there. And if I rearrange it, so let's look at uh, the different terms here in order to see that everybody is here. So this guy here was there, okay? This guy here is this one. This one comes from here and the last one is there. So everybody is there, okay? And now, uh, if you look at carefully what we have obtained, what we have obtained is merely that the phi entropy, which appears on the left-hand side of the integral of the function with respect to the first variable is less than the integral of the phi entropy of what of the variable of the function j of x1 and x2 and the, the this phi entropy has to be integrated with respect of the measure mu1 so the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side is that the integral and the entropy are commuted so commutation with an integral with respect to a probability distribution and entropy means that entropy is convex. This is intuitive. Now let's look, it, look, at, look at it uh, in a more formal way. If you take some alpha between zero and one, and if you take two random variables, u and v, you just have to define x1 as a Bernoulli distribution with parameter alpha independently of the pair of variables u, v that you decide to be x2. And you just apply the relation star here. You just apply it to the function of x1, x2, which is merely x1 times u plus one minus x1 times v. So these functions here is equal to u with probability alpha and to v with probability one minus alpha. So when you compute, excuse me, come back to the slide. And so when you compute the uh, left-hand side of the inequality above, what you get is this. And if, if you compute the right-hand side, what you get is that. And this proves that uh, the phi entropy is convex, of course, because this exactly means convexity. Okay, so of course, uh, in the situation where phi is a square or phi is x log x, we do know that the phi entropy functional is convex. And now the issue is on which condition of the function phi do we have convexity of the phi entropy? And we shall see that we can solve uh, this issue. That is, we can exactly characterize the convexity of phi entropy in terms of the property of phi. So first of all, uh, what we, since we have in mind to analyze power functions, 
we shall make our life easier by looking at the situation where the interval where the function phi has to take its values is simply uh, the, the uh, zero plus infinity. We shall assume that phi is uh, smooth, that it is continuous on zero plus infinity with zero included, and twice differentiable on the open interval, zero plus infinity, plus infinity with a positive second derivative on zero plus infinity. So it is, the, the assumptions here means that you have a smooth, uh, nice convex function on zero plus infinity, strictly convex. Okay. And so now what we want to do to, to show is that if the underlying priority space is rich enough, which means that you you are mapping uh, the measurable sets onto zero one. If you assume that phi is smooth in the sense that we have seen, then the convexity of phi entropy implies a strange condition on phi, which is one over phi second is concave on zero plus infinity. This looks strange, but in fact, this is the, the, the right condition to look at. This is a situation where one over phi second is concave. If we analyze what it means on power functions, on power functions, it exactly tells you that uh, alpha has to be between one and two. One is excluded and two is included. So the square is at the border and at the, uh, in some sense, the x log x is at the other border because x log x of course is uh, a function which is slightly uh, above the x function. And the other uh, thing that we can notice is that indeed the x square and the x log x are borderline cases in the sense that in this case, the one over five second uh, concave condition is satisfied, but is just satisfied. That is the, the, the one over five second function is affine. In the case uh, of the square, it is constant. And in the case of x log x, it is linear. So it's really the situation where uh, there's two functions, x squared and x log x, are the two border functions for this property. And talking about power functions, the, the right power to look at are powers between one and two. Oops. Now we have to see the proof. So the proof of convexity is necessary. Uh, excuse me. This is not at all that. It is that proof of one over five second concave necessary for convexity of the phi entropy. So first of all, the, the fact that the underlying space is rich enough allows us to define 
a pair of variables x, y, which take the value small x, small y with priority theta, and another value x prime y i with probability one minus theta. And this holds whatever x, y, x prime, y prime, and theta in zero. And the convexity of the phi entropy in particular implies that the phi entropy computed at alpha x plus one minus alpha y is less than alpha times the phi entropy of x plus one minus alpha times the phi entropy of y. So this can be computed because the x and y variables are very uh, easy to describe. They are uh, very simple variables. And so this uh, inequality uh, that express convexity of the phi entropy here can be rewritten in the following way. If we introduce the function of two variables f alpha of u and v, which is merely alpha times phi of u plus mi one minus alpha times phi of v minus phi of alpha u plus one minus alpha v. The uh, inequality above means Let's call it star as usual. Star means that f alpha at point theta of xy plus one minus theta at point x prime y prime is less than theta times f alpha of xy plus one minus theta f alpha of x prime y prime. So in other words, f alpha must be convex. in theta is arbitrary. And F alpha, as you see from its definition, is a smooth function. So you have a, a, a convex, a smooth convex function of two variables, which has to be convex so you know that this means that the determinant of the Hessian of the function has to be non-negative at any point where it is computed. So if we make this computation of the determinant of the Hessian, and if we take some uh, notation here, I denote by u alpha, the combination between u and v here, I denote it by u alpha. 
the, the, the determinant of the Hessian of F alpha greater than zero exactly means that phi second at point U times phi second at point V is larger than alpha phi second at point V times phi second at point U alpha plus one minus alpha phi second at point U minus phi second at point U alpha. And now if we divide this inequality by phi second of U, phi second of V times phi second of U alpha, what you get at the end of the day is that one over phi second of U alpha has to be larger has to be larger than alpha over phi second of u plus one minus alpha over phi second of v. And this has to hold true for all u, v, and all alpha in zero one. one. And of course, this means that one over five second is contained. And the proof is done. So we know now that one over second concave is necessary for the convexity of phi entropy. So now uh, we need the converse, that is, uh, we need to show that one over five second concave means convexity. And more than that, we want to get uh, an explicit duality formula. And this is doable. We can indeed prove uh, a duality formula. If phi is smooth in the sense uh, that I have mentioned above, that is essentially uh, you have a second derivative which is uh, positive on the half line zero plus infinity. And if you assume that one over five seconds is concave, then you may express the phi entropy as a soup of a linear functional with respect to y, which has this shape here. So the comment is that if you plug uh, the x log x case, if you look at the situation where phi of x is x log x, then you recover exactly the duality formula that we had for the classical case for classical entropy. Okay, but otherwise, of course, you have another formula. So let's see uh, the proof of uh, the duality formula. So of course, uh, 
the, 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 the soup is not a problem because it is achieved at y uh, equal to t. So what we have to, to show is that the soup is achieved at y equal to t. So it is enough. check that for uh, all t, the entropy, the phi entropy of y is larger than uh, the expectation of phi prime of t minus phi prime of expectation of t. multiplied by y minus t plus phi of t and minus phi of expectation of t. Let's call it star. So the idea is very simple. We fix t and we define a function for alpha between zero and one. We look at H alpha, which is merely equal to uh, the value of the right hand side here, but plugging T alpha instead of T. And what is T alpha? T alpha is just the variable which is equal to Y when alpha is equal to zero and which is equal to T when alpha is equal to one. Uh, uh, T alpha is equal, excuse me, here it's Y not t. Okay, so t alpha is equal to y when uh, alpha is equal to zero and is equal to t when alpha is equal to one. And so you plug a t alpha instead of t in the right hand side here of the inequality. In this right hand side, we make t becomes t alpha. And this allows us to define h alpha. So I rewrite it. It's expectation of phi prime of t alpha minus three, phi prime of expectation of t alpha. Just, just we, say alpha. Alpha, alpha, say alpha. Alpha, c'est euh, une variable. Je définis une fonction sur 0, 1, donc alpha est une variable. Si tu définis t alpha, c'est quoi t alpha t alpha, c'est ce que j'ai écrit ici. C'est la variable aléatoire qui est égale à euh, y si alpha est égal à 0 et qui est égale à t si alpha est, est égal à 1. C'est je suis en train de tracer un segment entre Y et T. OK uh, So it's T alpha here. Plus phi of T alpha. And minus phi of expectation of T alpha. So uh, now what I want to prove is that H is non-increasing because uh, H at point zero is just the left-hand side 
of star. And h at point one is just the right hand side. of star. So if h is non-increasing, this means that uh, h at point 0 is larger than h at point 1. And in, this is exactly what we want to prove. That is, the left-hand side is larger than the right-hand side. So now the proof reduces to the fact that h is non-increasing. And now to prove that H is non-increasing, we merely have to compute a derivative. So at this point, I have to tell you that uh, taking derivative in those kind of formula, you can do it formally. This is what I am going to do. But of course, you have to check that you are in a situation to uh, derive under expectations. And the, the, the easiest way to get this is to have bounded variables. So you can see in the, in de the details of the proof in the notes. In the notes, uh, the proof is uh, detailed in the sense that the truncation argument is detailed and uh, uh, you, you can see all the details here, okay? But here, I shall do exactly as if uh, there were no difficulty in uh, the commutation between derivation and expectation. So we derive with respect to alpha. Uh, and we have to realize in, the, in those computations that when we derive T alpha, what we get is T minus Y. So this will make this, this T minus Y appear everywhere. So when you do the computation explicitly, what we get is the following. We have minus expectation of T minus Y times times phi prime at T alpha minus phi prime at expectation of T alpha. This is the first term. Then you have the second term, which is expectation of Y minus T alpha multiplied by t minus y, phi second of t alpha. Third term, which is minus expectation of t minus y, phi prime of t alpha. Uh, excuse me. The third term is uh, not that this one, excuse me. Second, the second term is this one, okay. And the third term is y minus t alpha expectation times the expectation of t minus y time phi second expectation of T alpha. And you have a fourth term, which is the expectation of T minus Y phi prime of T alpha. And the last term, which is minus expectation of T minus Y multiplied by phi prime expectation of T alpha. And now we have to realize that Y minus T alpha is nothing else than alpha multiplied by Y minus T. 
and we see that the first order terms cancel. Is the terms which involves phi prime. And we end up with a formula where only the second order terms uh, are involved, that is H prime alpha equals <laughs> minus alpha. <laughs> The first, the, first order. Order, the first order terms cancel. They disappear. Cancel. They cancel. They disappear. Okay. Minus alpha expectation of y minus t square phi second of t alpha. plus alpha expectation of y minus t square times phi second of expectation of t alpha. So we can rewrite it in this way, minus alpha multiplied by expectation of y minus t square phi second of t alpha minus expectation of y minus t square multiplied by phi second of expectation of t alpha. And we ask ourselves now, is it non-negative or not? If this guy is non-negative, then globally H prime will be non-positive. So H will be non-increasing and this is the end of the story. So now uh, the things reduce to proving that this quantity here is non-negative. So if you look at this, this quantity carefully, you see that the square is commuted with expectation. So it looks like uh, a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So we, we, we begin with a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. We use Cauchy-Schwarz. to upper bound uh, this term here. So by Cauchy-Schwartz, the expectation of y minus t square is less than uh, the expectation of y minus t square times phi second of t alpha multiplied by the expectation of one over phi second of t alpha. This is Cauchy-Schwartz by putting a weight which is just the square root of phi second of t alpha. So you make this uh, product appear here. So you see that uh, it looks as uh, our uh, favorite uh, quantity, apart from the fact that uh, we have here expectation of one over phi second of T alpha instead of phi second of expectation of T alpha. Well, but <laughs> it's exactly concavity that we have to use now. Concavity, of uh, one over phi second ensures that you can upper bound uh, the quantity which appears here by keep this uh, 
and we put one over five seconds of expectation of T alpha. And it's over because as soon as you have this, this is less than that. If you plug in this here, this means that the quantity that we were looking at is non-negative. So this is the end of the proof. And this is a good point to make a coffee break. So let us come back to the presentation. And let's see now that you have proved the duality formula for phi entropy, how it leads to a subadditive inequality, exactly as we have seen for the variance case and for the classical entropy case. So the subadditive inequality for phi entropy, first I recall the notations. So as usual, X bracket I is merely the original vector, but where you have removed the I coordinates and the variables X1, Xn are independent, of course. And we denote by uh, expectation bracket I here, the expectation knowing uh, X bracket I. And finally, the phi, the conditional phi entropy is defined as the usual phi entropy, but where you put the conditional expectation instead of the ordinary expectations. So now the statement of the subadditive inequality for phi entropy is not surprising. You assume that uh, the function f is uh, smooth in the one hand, and that in the other hand, one over five seconds is concave, which ensures that you have a duality formula in your pocket. Then for all non-negative integrable variables, which are functions of the independent variables x1, xn, you have that the entropy the phi entropy is less than the sum of the expectation of the conditional phi entropy. So not surprising at all. This is exactly the same result as for entropy, but you have there phi entropy. So the proof is very short. Uh, and since we have done it uh, two times already, one time for the variance and another time for the usual entropy. I will get just a sketch of the proof. I will uh, give you just a sketch of the proof. So how does it work? Uh, we start from a telescopic formula with the conditional expectations here. So I will recall you that this expectation I here is merely expectation knowing the first variables up to xi. So you have this telescopic formula. And afterwards, uh, you just uh, use the fact that the expectation bracket i, when, if you apply it to the conditional expectation, knowing all the variables uh, up to xi, it's the same that the expectation of uh, the conditional expectation, knowing all the variables up to xi minus one. This is something that you have used again and again. And if you use this, you realize that uh, in this telescopic formula above, the terms that appear are merely the uh, phi entropies, bracket I, computed on the expectation of Y knowing the variables up to XI. 
So you have here an identity. And this equality becomes an inequality when you want to commute this expectation, this conditional expectation and the entropy. If you commute there's two here, then of course we'll get an inequality and the inequality will be the one that you want. And commuting these two operators, this conditional expectation and this conditional entropy is just using the duality formula. I leave you this as an exercise. It's a good exercise for you uh, because you will check that you have uh, understood the two times we have done this exercise already for the variance and the usual entropy. And you will, you will see that this holds true here. And as soon as, as, soon as you have this uh, inequality here in your pocket, then it is very easy to conclude because you just have to uh, conclude by using the fact that the expectation computed on the conditional expectation makes this conditional expectation disappear and you get exactly uh, the inequality that you want. So now you have uh, at hand this nice subadditive inequality. And to produce uh, the kind of the analogues of log sub inequalities that we have in mind, uh, we need now to introduce a variational or a symmetrization argument. So I begin with the symmetrization argument. Uh, no, first of all, uh, first of all, I would like just to, to mention that the, the kind of inequalities that you have in view, you have in view to produce inequalities that links the uh, phi entropy of a convenient transformation of the variable of interest and the V plus quantity that we have seen appear several times right now. So I remind you that the V plus quantity is defined as like that, that is uh, as the expectation of the sum, the conditional expectation, knowing uh, X of the sum of the Z minus Z prime I positive part square. And this is the very quantity that we have seen appear uh, in Efranstein's inequality in order to bound the variance. And this is also the quantity that you have made appear uh, when we have proved our um, exponential Efranstein's inequality, starting from inequalities that have a, a log sub uh, flavor. And alternatively, and this is the other way uh, we have uh, uh, bound, uh, uh, interpreted the, the upper bound in Efranstein's inequality, Alternatively, we can use uh, the situation where we have at hand uh, X bracket I measurable variables, such that Z minus ZI is non-negative. And in this case, we can use the V quantity here as an upper bound uh, for the variance. So uh, it's clear that the non-negativity uh, assumption here is useless to get uh, a French teens bound, but it is useful uh, for, the, for the rest of the, the, the lecture. That is, we, sh we shall need this non-negativity uh, assumption. So now I turn to uh, phi sub f type inequalities, that is inequalities that will play the same role as the log sub f inequality uh, in the preceding uh, chapter. So first of all, uh, I have an exercise for you, a real analysis uh, exercise, which amounts to show that if one over five seconds is concave, then it is also the case for the derivative of phi, and it's also the case for the increment function here that is, you look at the 
uh, increment uh, over x, the increment ratio. And this function here is also concave. So I, I will denote it by rho uh, in what follows. And you know, uh, it's quite subtle because you have a, a convex function at, at the beginning, your function phi, and phi prime uh, is of course an increasing function, but it has to be concave. So I begin with the symmetrization argument, which is very simple to express. You look at uh, an, an independent copy of Y and the statement is that when you look at the phi entropy, it is less than the expectation of the difference between Y and Y prime, it's positive part, times this uh, increment ratio rho uh, computed at Y minus rho computed I, uh, at Y prime. So let's see the proof, it's a, a few lines proof. So first of all, we may, always assume that uh, phi at zero is equal to zero because otherwise you uh, just change the function phi into phi minus phi of zero. It's a fact that uh, when you subtract a constant to phi, it does not change the phi entropy. So phi entropy is not sensitive uh, when you subtract a constant to the function. So by symmetry, the upper bound that you are looking at is just twice, uh, is just a half, excuse me, of the same quantity, but where you remove the positive part. And now our goal is to prove that uh, the phi entropy is less than one half this guy. So we are computed, you are uh, computing this guy, and this guy is in is easily computable. We have just to expand the expectation of this product. So you have two times, two sort of, uh, two kinds of uh, quantities. You have the quantities which appear when you multiply y by rho of y, and the same with the y prime, but which is a copy of y. And this gives you, when you multiply y by rho, by rho of y, this gives you phi. So this gives you two times the expectation of phi of y. And you have the cross products here when you have uh, y prime multiplied by rho. And this time this makes appear the expectation of y times the expectation of rho of y. And now it's time to use the concavity of rho. Since rho is concave, the expectation of rho of y is always uh, larger than rho, the expectation of y, uh, smaller, excuse me, excuse me, than the rho expectation of y. And so when you plug it, when you plug this in the inequality, you get that, is, that the, the, the original quantity here is uh, larger than the quantity where you have uh, just substituted to this factor, this factor here. And just the concavity tells you that this guy is always larger than this guy. And so at the end of the day, you recover uh, two times the phi entropy of y. So you have the symmetrization argument in your pocket. So alternatively, you can use a variational argument so the variational argument, we have seen it already in, for the usual entropy case. So here it's exactly the same, uh, but uh, with a general uh, phi function. So here it's just convexity. In fact, we do not use uh, the concavity of one of the five second. It's just convexity. You just look at the right-hand side here, the way uh, it behaves with respect to you. You derive the function with respect to you and you realize that, oops, excuse me.
and you realize that uh, the minimum of the function is achieved at point u equal to expectation of y, just because you have the first order terms which cancel, and you end up with u minus expectation times phi second, which is a positive number. And at the end of the day, you know that uh, the minimum is achieved at this point, and at this point, it is exactly equal to the, the phi entropy. So phi entropy uh, can be interpreted as this infimum here. This is a very rational argument. So now we have two versions of uh, phi sub f type inequalities, depending on the fact that we shall use the symmetrization argument or the variational argument. So if we use the symmetrization argument, the phi sub f inequality uh, can be stated in the following way. We have the, 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 assertion, the assumptions which are not surprising to make because uh, assuming that phi is smooth and that one over phi second is concave is just what you have in mind because you need to uh, get, uh, we, you need to use the phi entropy when it is convex. So this uh, assumption here ensures you that the phi entropy will be convex. And now uh, you, you have to uh, realize that uh, you will not use the phi entropy on the original variable z, but on a conveniently chosen transformation of z. And this transformation, I call it j here. And the upper bound that you get is that the phi entropy of j of z is less than the expectation of v plus times this quantity here. And this quantity, uh, it is not surprising to find j prime square of z. Uh, it's maybe more surprising to find uh, rho playing a role here, but rho is playing a role uh, in the sense that in order that this inequality holds, you need that uh, j, j is not chosen in a stupid way with respect to rho. So have in mind that in the classical case, you will make an exponential transform while the original function is x log x. So intuitively, the transformation that we, you will make on the variable has to be linked with the function phi that you have put in your phi entropy. And the, the functions, the transformations which, has admissible, which are admissible as those, are those for which the combination between rho and j is convex, which merely means that j has to be slightly more convex than rho is concave. Remember that rho is concave. So j has to be slightly more convex than rho is concave. This is the way you have to interpret this assumption here that rho combined with j is convex. And so if, if it is so, it also appears in the, the, um, in this expression, uh, in this expression here. Whoops. Excuse me, I was too fast. Again. Yes, so the first comment is that I have not, I have not told you that J was a, smooth in the sense that you have a second derivative or so. Uh, and in fact, you do not need it. Uh, you do not need uh, anything else than the fact that the function j is convex. And if it is not differentiable, at least you know that it has the right uh, derivative. And this is the right de derivative which has to be used here in the formula. And it's enough. So the, the second comment is that if you plug uh, in the above inequality, the J function, which is the exponential and the phi function, which is X log X, then you exactly recover the log sub F type inequality that we have proved before. That is, we entirely 
get a generalization of this inequality. And now the alternative uh, is to use the variational formula and the subadditive sub sub inequality for phi entropy again, of course. And this time, the alternative uh, phi sub inequality that we get has exactly the same flavor as the one before, except that instead of the rho function, we make the phi prime function appear. They play, intuitively, they play the same role, okay? Uh, so the phi prime function appears exactly as rho appeared before. And of course, since phi prime is concave, the condition phi prime combined with j uh, has to be convex means that, again, j has to be slightly more convex than phi prime is concave. And we see uh, that the, the, this is the same formula as before, apart from the fact that v appears instead of v plus, and despite of the fact also that the derivative of phi appears instead of the derivative of rho. And we have a slightly different factor. We have a one half instead of one. But apart from that, we have an exact analog uh, of the preceding inequality. So let's see the proof. The proofs of these two inequalities. Proof of the phi sub f inequality. So the function j is assumed to be uh, non decreasing, to be convex, and to be non negative. This is the assumption on the, on the function j. So if I take x, which is less than y, j of y minus j of x lies between 0 and y minus x times j prime at point y, which is the largest from the two points. So this is just convexity here. And this is uh, here the monotonicity. So here we have this uh, relationship. And now uh, the function rho combined to j has the same properties. And so you have similarly the fact that rho j of y minus rho j of x is less than y minus x times the derivative of rho combined to j, that is j prime of y times, uh, uh, excuse me, this is not what I wanted to, to write. This, at this stage, I just keep the derivative of the composed function, okay? So this is the derivative uh, of rho combined to j here. And if I combine these inequalities, I find that the product j of y minus j of x multiplied by rho j of y minus rho j of x is less than y minus x squared times the derivative of j times the derivative of rho composed with j. Now, 
Now we use the subadditive inequality. tells us that the phi entropy of J of Z is less than the expectation of the sum of the conditional phi entropies of J of Z. And we use the symmetrization argument. We use the symmetrization argument, but not on the original entropy for the conditional entropies. And so if we do that, this makes a peer a conditional expectation of what? Of the quantity, which is merely J of Z minus J of Z prime I, positive part square times rho of J of Z minus rho J of Z prime I, like that. But look, the quantity which appears up there, this product here, is just, excuse me, there is no square here. The quantity which appears there is just the quantity here with y equal to z and x equal to z prime i. Why is it so? Because uh, it is so as soon as the quantity is alive. The positive part will kill this quantity if z is less than z prime i. So the only quantities that interest us is in the situation where z is larger than z prime i. So in this case, we can play with this inequality, which is there, with y being z and x being z prime i. And so we, if we use this inequality, if we use star, what you get is that uh, the phi entropy is less than the sum of the expectations, the expectation will kill the condition of expectation of z minus z prime i positive part square times the derivative of j square computed at z times rho prime j of z. And this is exactly the required quantity, the quantity.
quantity that you wanted to make appear. So the, the only point here is that uh, I should have written that this guy is equal to J prime Y rho prime J Y. This makes the, the J prime square appear. And at the end of the day, you get the log sobolev inequality. The phi sobolev inequality, excuse me. So for, for the variant, for the alternative, the proof is about the same. So we still use uh, the subjective inequality, of course, but in order to bound the phi, the conditional phi entropies, we use this time the variational formula. On the conditional entropies, phi entropies. So this tells us that this conditional phi entropy here is less than the conditional expectation of phi j of z minus phi j of z i minus j of z minus j of z i times phi prime of j of z i. This is because z i is x bracket i measurable. And now uh, we analyze the behavior of the function h, which at point t gives phi of j of y minus phi j of t minus j of y minus j of t phi prime j of t. That is the very function which appears here, but uh, you see here, you have the y variable which correspond to z and the t variable which correspond to z i. Since you know that z i is less than z, uh, here we analyze the, the, this quantity when t is less than y. So let us derive h with respect to t. This is uh, an easy computation to make and you find that the derivative with respect to t is nothing else that minus phi prime applied to j prime t times j of y minus j of t. So remember that j is convex. So j of y minus j of t is in turn less than j prime of y, y minus t. And so at the end of the day, 
when you look at minus h prime of t, it is a non-negative function, which is less than uh, phi prime combined with j that you uh, derive at point y times j prime at point y multiplied by one uh, y minus t. And now if you integrate this inequality, you get that h at point x, which is equal to the integral between x and y of minus h prime t dt is less than y minus x square over two, because you have this integration here, times j prime square of y, Oh, Monsieur, Monsieur H oui. in the back, on the spot, H in the back. Pardon? H in the back, I got the hold the spot. Oui. Pourquoi H in the back, I got the hold? Ben, parce que quand tu regardes la fonction en, euh, pour t égale y, ça vaut zéro. Okay. okay. Poser la question, c'est y répondre, hein, donc... Euh... Voilà. Donc voilà, euh, phi second of j of y, which appears here. And therefore, when you come back to uh, the phi conditional phi entropy of this transformation of z, this is less than the conditional expectation of z minus z prime i square over two times j prime square computed at z times phi second j of z. And if we use the subadditive inequality, This tells you that the phi entropy itself now is less than the expectation of the sum of those guys here. That is, at the end of the day, expectation of V j prime square z phi second j of z. And the proof is over. So now let us come back to the presentation. We have our phi sub f inequalities uh, in our pocket. And now the purpose of the game is to derive moment inequalities from this sub -lef, phi sub -lef inequalities. So the trick is to uh, introduce well-chosen power functions. So if we want to get uh, inequalities on the Q moment, we have to uh, calibrate the J function and the phi function in order that when we combine the two, we get to the power Q. So you see that the easiest way to get this is to take phi as a power function, x to the power q over alpha, and to take j as a power function also, which is merely z minus expectation of capital Z, positive part to the power alpha. If you do that, you make this, the power q appear. 
And so the preceding inequality tells you that the phi entropy, in this case, when you have made these choices here, this represents the phi entropy. of the transform J of Z, which gives you exactly the left-hand side. And as for the right-hand side, you have to compute the, the various derivatives which are involved, but this is, this is the polynomial uh, computation. And you get alpha times Q minus alpha, expectation of V plus time Z minus expectation of Z, positive part to the power Q. And this is true if all the constraints of the functions are satisfied. So remember, phi has to be uh, convex, one over phi second is concave, and the combination between uh, phi, between the, the, the rho function and j has to be uh, convex. So if you put this, all these conditions together, this means that the powers, uh, have some constraints and the, the constraint is there, that is alpha has to be between Q over two and Q minus one. But apart from this, uh, this is true for all these alpha. So we have some choice now to make uh, of an adequate alpha. So maybe it's interesting to, to make the decoupling of this term in order to to get a better idea of uh, what alpha has to be chosen. So if we make the decoupling, which is very simple here because it amounts to uh, use Hölder's inequality. If you use Hölder's inequality, you just get an upper bound, which makes the uh, LQ over two norm of V plus appear. And again, the LQ norm of z minus expectation of z positive part appear. So this is a little bit embarrassing because uh, we have already the same quantity on the left hand side. But of course, it's not the same power and you have something which is multiplied by it and you have also a multiplying factor. So it's, it does not appear with the same uh, normalization. And so now the idea is the following one. If you have the uh, just the LQ norm of the quantity Z minus expectation, which appears on the left and right hand side, and see that you have this extra term here uh, with a choice of alpha to make, an, a, a, a sensitive choice is to take alpha equal to Q minus one in order to make some induction inequality appears. That is an inequality on the Q moments that we are looking at, but which links the Q moment to the Q minus one moment. So this is exactly what we do now. And we see that uh, a nice induction inequality appear, which is the following one here. And if you do the same uh, with the modified Sobolev inequality, the analog, but uh, when you have the quantities zi, which I use instead of z prime i, then you have the v quantity, which appears, which, which plays the same role as v plus, and you just have a slightly different shape for the constant here. Instead of q minus one, you have q over two. But apart from that, you have an analog of the preceding inequality. And so now uh, the idea is that uh, starting from this, you have an induction to perform, which will play the same role as solving a differential inequality uh, as uh, we did when we were using uh, the moment generating function. And this is what we shall do uh, next time in order to produce a moment inequality. Just uh, to, to, to give you an idea and a flavor of what we shall do, think about what would happen if our life were even easier, if this term 
would not exist. If this term would not exist, you should readily derive from this inequality here that I'm dreaming, but uh, it's good to dream sometimes. You would get immediately that this would be less than what? You see that the power here is Q minus two. Here it's, it's Q, so it gives you a square. So this square would be less than Q minus one times V plus to the power Q over two, or something like Z minus expectation Z plus norm Q here is less than square, U, square root of Q minus one V plus Q over two. And so the inequality that we shall prove is essentially the same as that, but C'est parce que je l'ai oublié. Merci. So essentially, instead of this factor here, we shall get a constant tau times Q and times this. This is what we actually prove. We shall prove this with a tau, which is less than three, in fact. So essentially, the proof uh, will show that uh, this term here does not play a big role. And everything will uh, happen as if it, were, it was not there. So yeah, essentially, you will get uh, the, the same kind of inequality. So this is what we shall do uh, next uh, during the next lecture. So thank you for your attention.